Okay, good af- good afternoon, I think. Monday, the 21st of March. Uh, another surprise session here, right? I was just on last week with Jarrett, and I'm just booming here with J.C. Cahill. I can't believe it's taken me almost two years to get you on here, but better late than never, everyone. This is an old friend. I've known J.C., and I'm probably going to call him Jonathan a lot. So if any of you <laughs> people out there don't know, his real name is Jonathan. And that's probably what I'll call him. But I've known Jonathan since he was a teenager. And it's a pleasure to have you, Jonathan. Super happy to be on your show, Rob. I I, Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to talk. I'm really excited to kind of discuss some really fun things today. All right. And so you and I go way back. A lot of people don't know the history of how far you and I go back. Um, So... What, what, instead of my memories, right? You're the guest here, so let's let's see what your memories are of of how far back this goes with you and I. So, um, as a young man and as a kid, I remember you know you were one of Jerry Brown's very first employees. You were close friends with uh, Jerry, Larry, and Stephen, and you were not only a close friend, but you became uh, a confidant. Uh, you were a driver for them, and then their sales uh, sales lead, and then their sales manager. And my very first professional sales position was uh, underneath your tutelage. And uh, it was back in the day when. Uh, when what year? Uh, what year was that? That would have been 1998. 1998. Okay. So, so, I, so I, was, I was a young father at that time at 98. Yeah. Um, but before that, I can remember going to visits. Uh, your father's yard and you and your brother running around there on little RM80s or some kind of motorcycles. Dirt bikes, yeah. Yeah, and it was like you just these little gnats of kids like <laughs> cutting through the woods and mud bogs and hills and going back there. And that's when I got to meet your mother, who was a beautiful person and, and also a great friend. And your dad was somebody that taught me a lot of life lessons. And I've I've written some articles in ARA talking about a lot of the mentors I had and people that helped me. I talk about going back and looking through time and remembering the people that taught you things, good or bad, good lessons, bad lessons. There's always lessons. But I did learn a lot from your father. Um, and I would say that uh, I'm honored well, to have been someone that was his friend. Well, exciting to say, you know, you know, you think about my father in that position and I think about you in the same position. I remember being just a young kind of a young buck and not really knowing whether uh, I was doing the right or the wrong and having uh, you and Larry really uh, and Steve and shape, <clears throat> shape my uh, shape, my shape, my manhood about, you know, doing the right thing, working really hard, you know, showing up to work, you know, trying every day you know, that, um, you know, you were just, you were always good about, you know, think about your decision, make sure you're making the right decision. Don't, don't jump into something with two feet without thinking about it. And, you know, just those lessons, those core lessons that you taught me when we were, when we first worked together, you know, back in the day, it was, it it was, it was in vogue to not tell the truth. You didn't always tell the truth. And now we're at, now we're at the precipice on the other side of it, whereas disclosure and transparency has become, you know, the, conduit to a successful salvage art today and you you were you you were early adopter to, to telling the truth doing the right thing not you know not blowing smoke up customers you know rear ends about something that should isn't isn't true and um you know a lot of those a lot of that work ethic a lot of those things that you taught me really really lasted with me for a long time in my career and actually it's some of the things that brought me into the position today so you're you're working for me. I'm teaching you how to sell, and you come to me and you say, "I met this girl and I love her." And believe it or not, everyone, and her last name is Rainwater. Uh, no no relation. relation. So I don't <laughs> believe you. But you come to me and you say, "I have this opportunity in my life." Um, and my advice was, "Go, young man. Right? Just you're young. Right? You have this. Follow your passion." And, and go and and you did you packed up the, your uh convertible uh vw whatever the uh, cabriolet right and you uh put some techno music on well, i was and off. uh yep. off you go mm-hmm. and tell just so tell everybody who doesn't know all your background you left you went out and you were pretty successful very proud of, of some of the things you accomplished quickly and and kind of how you jumped around 
Yeah. So I was fortunate enough that, you know, we took we took a month off after the trip and we went west and and we, we started in Portland, Oregon. And, and the facility that I first started at was LKQ's number, I think, number seven facility. It's called John's Import in Portland. And I worked as a salesperson and I mentored under a guy named Doug DeClote. Doug was a was a gentleman similar to yourself that was open minded and would teach me you know, how to sell and teach me how to gain customers and taught me, um, you know, how the world worked a little bit. And, you know, he got me into some things that I'd never been part of, you know, Tony Robbins, Zig Ziglar, Tom Hopkins, all of that self-help stuff when it was uh, tapes and things like that. And I learned that, you know, that, that it's my destiny in front of me. It's my life. It's my opportunity. And uh, I became a, a pretty successful salesperson on the West Coast. And, and during that process, uh, Ford, which was Greenleaf at the time, was recruiting for a program of young executives called Green Stars, and they were basically looking for young executives to put into uh, set roles in the salvage business. And because of my experience in education, it put me in a, a really nice position. So I went to Seattle, Washington and worked for uh, a company called Fitz Auto Parts, which was one of the early, early uh, Greenleaf Yards and started off with one of their facilities that was doing about $100,000 a month. And we got it turned around to about $300,000 a month. So we went from about a million two business to a $3.5 million business in a year because of the work that <clears throat> I put forth with, you know, closing deals and some of the some of the work that you had taught me, some of the work that Doug had taught me, some of my own life experiences. And I was fortunate enough to get in this program. And, and then I got recruited back and, and to move to Las Vegas to be the assistant site manager under 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 uh, under Ford, under under the Ford umbrella. And Ford at the time wouldn't allow any uh, site managers under 30 years old. So I was too young. They considered it like a dealership. But I was too young for them to put me into a site management role. So I was listed as the assistant site manager. And I started with the facility in uh, North Las Vegas and we started off. And when I got there, they they were doing about uh, three hundred thousand dollars a month. And when I left, they were doing about nine hundred and fifty. And that was about two and a half years later. Now, in the middle of that opportunity, uh, LKQ Ford had become sold. They had sold to a private equity group, which is uh, similar to the current group that owns Phoenix today. And uh, I had decided to hitch my wagon to LKQ again, went back to LKQ, worked for them, um, built, helped direct a call center out of uh, out of L.A. And then came back to the city of Las Vegas and worked from a transfer hub into a facility and did it in 18 months. So we re legitimately sat in a market with no customers, no anything and a terminal with Nextels and, and, a, and, a, and a secretary and a couple drivers and built a market. And from that point, then uh, Joe, I worked directly for Joe Holston and Joe uh, gave me the opportunity to find a facility. And we bought Southern Nevada Auto Parts uh, as as a young man, as a GM. So I did the due diligence. I did the work around the facility and I, I was a GM after that. At that point, Greenleaf had reapproached me a few years later and said, hey, we really want you back on the team. We know you did a great job there. Um, we're now private equity and we'd like you to be uh, the national sales manager. So I spent... Um, a few years in that position, uh, directing inside salespeople. Uh, we had about 300 inside sellers, and my job was to manage the seller's process, commission plans, development strategies, phone calls, all the things that the, that a national sales manager does. And at the time, Greenleaf uh, was doing okay, but they were on a turnaround scenario from Ford. And um, you know, I got to the end of I got to the end of my career in that position, and looked around and said, you know, I really I really like site level. I really like I do. The, the boardroom's fine and it was nice to be an executive and I was a young man and I sat in these meetings and everything went just fine, but it wasn't where my passion was. And my passion was figuring these, figuring problems out. So um, I said, give me a facility that's struggling and I'll go fix it. So I did. So I went down to Seguin, Texas, did a turnaround in Seguin, Texas, was there for about a year and a half. And at that moment, um, after I did that turnaround, I got I got sent to Tampa, Florida to oversee uh, Greenleaf's largest facility. And they were and at the time they were struggling, wasn't making money. Uh, three years later uh, <clears throat> and a lot of hard work, uh, we were we, we became cash positive and, and one of and one of the one of the one of their better facilities at the point that we get to the end of that rope. Uh, Greenleaf had then decided to sell to Snitzer Steel, and there was going to be a combined unit, the self-service and full service. So Greenleaf on one side and pick and pull on the other. 
and I was hand chosen to build a uh, yard basically from nothing from I built a hybrid yard. Um, it was the first combined unit where it was uh, pick and pull and full service all wrapped up into one. We did about $3 million build out and uh, we ran a really, really neat facility in Chandler, Arizona. And I did that job for about three years and I really, really enjoyed it. And at the end of that, um, I just, I, I, my, we were living in Florida. I was working out of Arizona. I was traveling quite a bit. And I just said, you know, it's, it's time for me to kind of set some roots down somewhere. And, you know, I kind of had, had my fill with corporate America and nothing bad about it. It just was time for me to look for my next opportunity. And I had been friends with Rick and Brian Perlenfine for quite some time. And uh, they offered me a position to run <clears throat> their facility in Tacoma. And from that point forward, we did really, really well together. And they were uh, great mentors, great people. I worked for them for about four years, really liked the company, really liked the family. And one day I woke up and said, I want my name on the building. And, uh, you know, they hadn't hired me under those expectations. So when I when I came to them with that opportunity, they said, you know, our, your name is in our last name. And I said, I, I know that. And they said, we really like you and you, we've done well by you and you've done well by us. And, you know, I understand what you want, but, you know, we're not prepared to make that decision today. And I said, therefore, OK, then I am. And so 10 years ago, packed my toys and went from Tacoma, Washington, all the way to Winchenden, Massachusetts, showed up in Winchenden. With, with my big boy pants and pulled all the way up and flew and convinced my wife to fly out there and live in central Massachusetts. And we started with five employees and a partnership with Mark Brown. And uh, Mark and I had some agreements. Uh, his son, Matt, had not graduated from college at the time. And he was working on, to, uh, working on some multiple facilities. And Joan and I and Holly and Mark were all business partners. And Holly stayed on working for Frito-Lay and I continued on running the yard. And first three years were difficult. Um, you were actually, it was pre Phoenix. You were still with Jerry Brown's, I think at the time. Mm, close. Yeah. yeah I was there until 2013. Right. So at the point that, um, we all agreed that, you know, the Browns had given us an opportunity to buy them out and it was a, it was a, it was a partnership that we had all agreed upon. And three years later we bought them out and then, uh, Holly and I, and, uh, a couple other people uh, came to, came and helped us. Some people from my past, a guy named George Holmes, had helped us quite a bit. Uh, another person, Steve Gallant, helped us quite a bit. Uh, another another young man, Dustin Holden, helped us quite a bit. Uh, and all those guys, and we just built a really nice team. And we grew um, probably the largest family independent recycler in, in the Northeast and maybe in the country at the speed that we had. So when um, and then. Years later, we really had <clears throat> zero interest in in in, in selling the company. Uh, COVID happened, and some some other things kind of came to light. And I, you know, I said, you know, life is short. My family, um, we we didn't have any uh, we didn't have any family members in the business. We really didn't have a great exit strategy, and we decided that the be the best thing for Holly and I was um, to look at this opportunity. So we did, and uh, at that point. Uh, we sold and now we're sitting back and, you know, my, my family members, my father, all, all my family died early. So I want to make sure that I just didn't, you know, die in the salvage yard. I wanted, I wanted more than this. And I had built facilities and I had lived in different places and I, I understood turnarounds and I understood the market and I understood all these things. And that's really what I've done. The majority of my career is, you know, turn around facilities, fix them, build them, build the teams, develop a strategy and, and execute on it. And now today I'm trying to, now today we're looking at how do we make the business better? You know, our first side was, you know, we brought ourselves down here to Florida for a little while and we saw you down here, which was really fun. And so now we're on to kind of our next adventure and we've got a couple of things cooking. We did pretty good. 14 minutes. Not bad. We figured Jonathan and I would, uh, would kind of piece this out. It'd be a half an hour of, of remember when, but I wanted everyone to understand the full background and the full gamut. I don't think everybody understands. I mean, you talked about some big names there, right? Mm -hmm. right? There's a lot of big people that helped you and mentored you and the experiences you have, you know, very similar to mine. I think, you know, I've thanked all the people that have helped me from the very beginning to the very end. And now we're both here. Right. Mm -hmm. And for which is odd is that we're both really not recyclers anymore. Right. You and I are on another side. Yeah. And, but I'm doing exactly what I think I was meant to do, but I was Absolutely. meant to help and coach people. And I, and I say on this all the time, I am 100% blessed 
to be in the position I am, to have my kids where my kids are, to have my wife where I have now, the, the beautiful wife I have and the support staff and the things that I have, I'm a blessed person. And I think you would feel the same way. So we're at this spot in our lives and you make these decisions. And as I know, you're always thinking and hustling and jiving and moving. So now what? You know, I talked about this being, uh, let's get to know J.C. Cahill. But now I want to know, okay, you're done. You've sold your company. That all went well. You're hanging out in Dunedin, Florida, by the way, which is an unbelievable place to be hanging out. I got to spend some time there. And now, now what? What so so what so what's next is we have we have some opportunity we're going to be probably working with some people um, that we all know together Rob sooner than later we'll leave that as a teaser uh, but um, we also are involved in a facility down here in, in down here in uh, in Hudson which is uh, one of the deals that I had worked with uh, I did some consulting work for um, I kept some ownership in a facility down here in Florida um, I still have some ownership in a facility in upstate New York which is my brother's facility. And we're going to convert a, a full service to a self service down here in in Hudson, Florida, which we think is a good, which is a good market for, it, and it's the right space and it's the right deal. Um, and then, I'm really, I mean, that's a portion of what we're doing. Um, Holly's Holly's working on some some buying things and some other things that she's involved in. She's she's doing some coaching and things like that. But what we found is retirement is not on our on our agenda. We were workers. We were designed to work. We like to work. We like what we're doing. And, you know, I want to help other recyclers. I, I, I still have a passion for the business and I, I have some partnerships that I'm really proud of and thankful to be part of. I have a, a partnership with Todd Ensworth, who is who is the who is the developer of Car Eggs and Omni Yard. And Todd is Todd has created some uh, Todd is a brilliant, brilliant person, but he's created. <clears throat> He's created some uh, some web things that are that are really that are really going to change the industry. They're going to move the needle. And there's some people out there in the background that are really there's there's some precipice things that can happen in the next couple of years that could be really good for our industry, along with some of the headwinds that are happening. And I see everybody saying, well, you know, these consolidators are coming in. This is happening. And stuff. The truth of the matter is there's there's as, there's as much good business for as much as, as people want to take. It doesn't matter if the consolidators are there. It doesn't matter if they're not. It doesn't matter what it is, because, you know, we were literally all the competing facilities I've ever run. were right next to an LKQ right next to a competitor. It doesn't matter if you do good business, you're going to do good business. And and competition whether, whether, is good. Right. Competition yeah. is good. It is. And to me, the more the merrier and the more attention that gets brought into this industry, the consolidators and the Phoenixes and the Aesops and whoever else is out there and the LKQs and things are going to bring more attention, positive attention to this mm -hmm. industry as opposed to, you know, a tire fire on the five o'clock news. Well, absolutely. And, and, and to the point that everybody thinks that, you know, one of these guys, the, the people are out to take their lunch money, they, the consolidators really don't care. They're they're in for their own business. They're in to make it what they want it to be, whether it's, you know, profit, growth, uh, even whatever they're chasing is what they're chasing. And, you know, independent owners and independent family members that have really great facilities are very fortunate in the fact that they're going to have great facilities for a long time. You know, for us personally, you know, we looked at it as, as you know, we were 47 years old and, you know, we had we have been working at this for 10 years and I've been working my whole career traveling and taking the next opportunity and taking the next opportunity. And I, and I said, you know, when is it, when's a good time for me to take some chips off the table? If I had family members or I had an exit strategy that I could work, I probably would have done some things differently, but that's not how it went. And for me personally, it was, it was the right opportunity for us. Now, what that does for me today is, is allows me to play forward on some things that I'm really proud of. You know, we're working on, um, a tool that we're going to kind of highlight here today, but it's, it's right up the alley of what you're coaching in sales training. It's, it's, it makes us professional. It makes us competent. It makes us qualified and it, and it brings a level of, um, professionalism that it, that hasn't been brought to this industry in a long time. And it's called what? VinMatch Pro. So what, so what the purpose of this tool is <clears throat> we've designed this and, and I designed this around salespeople. And the salespeople that over the years, there's been a bunch of different things that salespeople have needed at their fingertips that they that they've had access to, but they're difficult to get, or they've had, you know, 27 tabs open and they have to find this, this, put this VIN in here to search this VIN to figure out what this fits, to do this, to do that. And my business partner came up with a 
I, a, br a brilliant idea of, of talking about a VIN comparison tool. So what we're what what it is not, and what and what we know that it is, is it's a tool that allows any cut anybody. And we're gonna pick we're gonna pick some vehicles and 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 just show you what happens. You this tool is basically five different things in one. You have a mileage history, just like you have from Carfax, which we're gonna show you what that looks like real quick. And what what it's what it does is <clears throat> we're pulling from from data records similar to Carfax, and it, it gives you. So we know that this is a uh, that is a 2011 Porsche Panamera. These are the mile. These are the service service increments that it went in at, and then we also give an estimated current mileage. So instead of you paying 495 for a Carfax, now your salespeople at a touch of their finger can or buyers right or, or your buy, buying or buy, it's really powerful in the buying position buyers inventory or sales can, with a touch of the finger can figure out the mileage or at least estimated mileage so that in itself if anybody knows their carfax bill it's significant and i know that what we were spending to buy um you know 200 to 300 vehicles a month we we're spending a significant amount of money with carfax the next thing that we've been working on which which i'm super proud of and i've watched I've watched some great salespeople really, really understand this and use the process is a plate to VIN decoder where you can actually um, take a plate number and decode it down to a VIN number. And this particular plate that I just ran was our Uber driver. That was when we did the PRP West re region meeting. This was the guy who this was his this was his truck that we drove in a 19 Escalade, which I have to thank Benzene. I appreciate the free ride that we went when we went over and saw Zane and those guys. And then what happens is after that, we're able to break, to break this VIN down into all these different opportunities, the engine, the transmission, the gear ratio. And that being said, if, if you're a salesperson and before you even got on the phone with a customer and you want to ask him the question, hey, I want to figure out the ratio of this vehicle. Once I run it, if I take use my search box, I now know that it's a GU5 323 ratio. I know that there's a build date here. I've got a mileage record here and I can now diagnose this vehicle and I can get through the customer. I can get through the phone call significantly faster. What so about like door mirror? If I said, so Hey, what's the door mirror here? Well, let's take a look and see. So here's our mirror. That's a really complicated one, Rob. And here's a perfect example. So in our sales process that we're asking the customer, I need a mirror for my 19 Escalade. And they're asking the questions and there's 400 questions in, in, in Hollander about, is it power fold? Is it power adjust? Does it do this? Does it do that? And the customer, I'm going to tell you, will give you those answers, but they're not always true or they don't always know. So now with this opportunity, you, you, you get to their plate number, type in mirror, and you have everything that you need to know to make an interchange decision based upon this, this thing. What, what I this like, I like how you said interchange decision, right? Mm -hmm. This is giving you the information, not the interchange number. Correct. correct. We, we are not writing interchange. We are, we are not right. There is, there is a big difference. We are not telling people what the parts are on the car. We are telling you what the VIN number decodes to. And we are taking multiple sources, um, quite a few sources actually, and combining it together and normalizing it so that it allows the, the layman and the expert to have a lot of different opportunities with things that they've never had vision of, you know, so um, everybody could get this information's on the web somewhere, but it takes your, it takes a lot of work to get there. I got a question, Chuck Smith, does it have Toyota rear axle info? It does on the later stuff. Um, on the earlier stuff, it does not. The 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 early Toyotas are very very difficult, and even the Toyota dealer doesn't have that VIN, that information. There's people out there that have decoded it based upon ratios. That is the most difficult one that that it has. So we we're we have some we have some strengths. We have some weaknesses. Our strengths are that this has a full gamut of of all vehicle makes and models. Our strengths are obviously in the import. Um, in the Korean, in, the, in in a handful of domestic, we we are actually uh, fixing to have an update and a new data source really quickly that's going to expand our Toyota reach and expand our Ford reach. So those two things are going to are going to take you know are, are on our next kind of our next update. All right. So we've got uh, any standpoint. Do you think there'll be any kind of VW, Audi, BMW transmission code stuff? Is Absolutely. one question. I yep. got Mike Swift says all makes models. I've been using it and I love it. Uh, and then we got Todd just came in with we've secured a contract for Toyota build. Data will go all the way back to 1980 coming soon, says Todd. Yep. Right. So, again, 
from the short time I've been involved with you in this a little bit, because again, JC and I are friends and he's been, you know, chirping my ear off about this for a year that it's coming. But what I have seen is every month, right? It's new. We got this now. We got this, right? The mileage didn't pop up like that before. Right. Now the mileage is coming right up. So it's like Todd and Jonathan are working every, I wouldn't even say every month, every week, there's just new little tweaks and ads that are continuing to take, I believe, this to that next level. Um, and again, anybody else that's watching, you know, feel free to comment. I know Mike Swift did that he has been using it. And like you said, are there a couple things we're still, oh, everything's going to have a couple little, oh, it didn't do this one and this one or that one, but a majority right. of what it is, again, similar to a bidding tool or what, it's a tool, it's, right? It's, it's, it, it's a tool. It's it's an it's an arrow in your quiver. It's it's you know it's but it we, where we think that this fits for 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 us in the sales side, you know, and it's really really important to think about this. Is our my goal and when we started these things was how do we get the right part delivered the first time? And you know, credits and returns. One of the things that we've been working on, and you know, we've run quite a few contests. I've had about seven people run contests, and of the seven, five of them have seen significant credit return reductions. A couple of them seen um, a significant close rate uh, increases. So, and you say, well, how does a VIN matching tool make that an opportunity for us? Well, I'm going to give you a couple examples. First of all, um, we're gonna we're gonna just do a quick demo on kind of where where this all things. We went to the mileage history plate to VIN, but now we're gonna go something that's really cool. This is our VIN matching product, and this is where where the rubber meets the road. So, as a salesperson, you're on the phone with a customer, and they want to give you a tag number. The part that you have in stock or the part that you're brokering, you can now drag into here and you can decode and match the two VINs. But I'm going to show you kind of how that looks real quick and show you um, a couple vehicles that we've been working on today that will have um, that have some different VIN numbers. And the, a really difficult one for all of us in, the, in this business is uh, anything over the 4500 range in, in a pickup truck. So. Um, when you talk about uh, something over uh, 4,500, it makes it very difficult. The next one, let me get this other one real quick and show you what these two look like. Here. We'll see. Our ability to decode and match other VIN numbers. Now watch, this is going to be really funny because this is going to be two different vehicles and two different matches and they're not going to match. So one of them is an Audi and one of them is a pickup truck. So if you look, the reason I did this and showed this to you this way was when, when these match, if these were the same vehicles and we can do, we're going to do, I just want to kind of give you a quick, what happens when they don't match. This is what happens when nothing matches. Guess what? They both had a front license plate bracket. They both had tinted glass. But all these X's are things that they match that the that the that the VIN number matches on. Let me show you what it looks like when we do it with one that is a, a similar VIN. Another Audi VIN. It kind of took us off, JC. That way the screen's a little bigger so people can read. That'd be great. <clears throat> Plus they're sick of the way you and I look anyway. We're two old men. That's exactly true. <laughs> And watch this. So these are two, it's a 2015 Audi A6 and a 2016 Audi A6. And if you take a look at them and say, okay, according to this, the engine, it is not, the engine is not a match between this one and this one. Okay. What it's doing is comparing the left VIN to the right VIN, it's saying the transmission is the same. It's got an eight speed Tiptronic with additional sport program and a manual shift mode. You've got a ratio, you've got speakers, you've got wireless one had wireless conductivity one of them didn't but as you go through this process and we and one of the questions that you asked rob was what happens in a mirror well let's take a look and see if, if, if the first one was one customers and the second one was other look at we know that the first vin has a body colored powered side mirror with manual fold and indicator we know that the one we compared it to the right side does not match that and it's different so if you look and see why they're different they're different and it gives you an X and a go. It says daytime running lights. It says all these things. So now all of these things that we can show between the two, you can see match up. 
Now look at right so, here. So let me ask you something. So if I'm a salesperson mm -hmm. and I'm in New York and I get mm -hmm. a call from a customer in California that's retail, mm -hmm. I could take their VIN to our VIN and make and confirm that the mirror is the same before I shipped it all the way to California. Even better than that, I can take the one. Say, let's say I'm a salesperson and I'm and I'm and I'm buying that mirror from somebody else. And before I broker that mirror, I'm can I can confirm from the customer's plate number or VIN number that the part I'm buying matches. So I so if I was brokering it from someone else, I I could actually identify it before I brokered it to make sure that even that my vendor is even entered it correctly. Correct. So let me give you a couple examples of why this is so powerful. So we're going to take a step back and say a lot of a lot of yards and, and where we found this thing to be extremely powerful is in the mileage history and the mileage history. You say, well, well, everybody can use Carfax, but now you, you don't have to tell your salespeople they're not they can use it on a regular basis. And they've got they're going through their Eden locator. They're going through their pin net or they're going through their car part and they want to check a part from a vendor that they don't traditionally use or somebody had forgotten to put in the mileage. And now your salespeople can get a feel of what the mileage is and they can shop better opportunities because that traditionally as a salesperson, you just wouldn't pick the, if it had zero mileage, you'd skip over the guy. Now you can make those decisions. The next piece that's really powerful and especially to the guys that are super rock and rollers, the guys get a phone call for something that's difficult, something that, that does that they need to see the, the interior code, they need the trim code, they need whatever they need to get that done. And guess what happens? Now, as a salesperson, I can take and run other people's VIN numbers and come up with, you know, this, I'm gonna pick a difficult one, this Porsche Panamera. Um, we're gonna enter. We're gonna enter this into our single VIN decode. So I can do either one with plate or VIN. And this porch Panamera, as I get into the customer, you know, the customer says, "I need a tail light for this." And what's the first thing out of a customer's mouth when you're speaking to them? Do you know if it's incandescent or LED? And all you need to do as a salesperson is type in tail light. And guess what? I come up. We know it's an LED tail light. You know, same thing with. Um, a lot of the power lids and lift gates, it's a difficult process from a, from a salesperson's perspective, especially when a body shop's calling to make sure that they, they need a power lift gate. And from that position, the salesperson can say, hey, do me a favor, give me your plate number. I'll run your plate and I'll check it out. Oh, it, it appears that that 2018 Yukon does have the power, power lift motor. And oh, by the way, the one I'm buying from my 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 competitor or I'm buying from my my partner, my my Midwest runner, my PRP, my RCD, whatever partnership or relationship you have, uh, before I ship that thing on some transportation network or before I ship something on freight, I'm going to make sure that it's the right part. It's the first time that we've had this ability. Now, where where the deficiency happens and where we 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 can't fix is. We are going, this is like calling the dealer and saying, hey, what is this VIN? What does it say? It is not interchange. And interchange is where, is where we all get a little funky because at the end of the day, yes, that engine will fit if they take it down, if they take the oil pan and the valve cover and the timing cover and the da-da-da, and we've written interchange and we figured out how to fit A into B. This is just the VIN to VIN decoding. So you still have to think about stuff. You still have to use your tools. You still have to it's use a tool. Your, yep. Now, again, I've got another question I'll ask you in a second. And sure. again, we're about 33 minutes in. So I know that you talked about this helping with non-interchange, say, Super Duty 450, 550 stuff. Absolutely. Right? So you could take, why don't you show me well, how let me show you, I had a yeah, Let me show you one that we just And did. I had a one-ton truck. How do I figure out what's what? Yeah. So one of the things that we've been, we worked on was to make sure that um, we can decode uh, 450, 550 Dodges, 450, 550 Chevrolets. I'm sorry, 4,500 Dodges, 5,500 um, Chevrolets, uh, anything in that category. And we're able to do those things with, with, with or no one else is able to do that. So single loop of in, we're gonna put this in here. And you know this tool was was really designed around, and here's an example, right? Guy just called me for a 4,500 Dodge pickup truck. And he's asking me the question. And this, this is a real example. So a friend of ours that we both know, a guy named Jay Cardinelli owns a, um, owns a tow company in upstate New York. Jay called me looking for this transmission. Well, there is no interchange for this transmission. There's no way to, for me to figure it out other than call the dealer and figure it out and run VIN numbers through. So what I did instead of, 
instead of saying no, we can't find it. When we when I was work when we were doing our some work for Greg at Clearwater, we we ran his VIN number. We got we got Jay's VIN, and then we got our the VIN numbers that we had available at uh, on on Exchange. And I'm going to show you what this all looks like. Um, what the what, how we did it. So we took the VIN number from the customer, and we took the VIN number that we had, and we went to our our new match VINs. We pasted the first one in, and then we're going to paste the other one in. One second. Paste this one in. And all that being said, it's the same then. No, it's the same one twice. Sorry about that. Uh, one, it's going to see that it's the same truck. I'm going to take, let me show you what one looks like when it's not the same truck. 373. There we go. Okay. So what we're able to do with no interchange was able to figure out that the transmissions, see this, how they matched? And those numbers would have been dot numbers. So they would have, so I, I used pin net or I used car part, searched based upon year range, and then searched the vehicle model. And then I just did comparison VINs back and forth to find the one, the correct one that matched. Now, if you take a look at that, we're, we're one of the few people or only people out there that is able to give you some of this information on these trucks. And if, if you're a truck guy and you've ever sold any of these parts, they're very difficult to figure out. And now we have actual ratios. Now we have color codes. Now we have interior codes. And think about this as a salesperson. You're on the phone. You, you hit click, click through the pictures. The picture doesn't have a very good picture of the VIN. They didn't put the, the trim code, the paint code, whatever, into the one that you think you need. Now you as a salesperson can take that single VIN, this to code right here, put this VIN number cut and paste it from car park, pinnacle, Eden, wherever, and now know what I'm looking for. So our other question we have, does they have the ability to show if a customer's <coughs> bin um, has been put through the auction before? <clears throat> we are not right now. Our only, our only data service that we're pulling out for is mileage. Um, we have not combined that stuff, but we have some future development programs with both uh, car part and with uh, inventory and bid buddy to work with them on some of these opportunities. We uh, we're just just it, 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 there's a teaser coming and I, I don't. It's wanna, in the works. It's that's all we works. could say. Yeah, it's in. The uh, works. And then Todd also threw in. Don't forget, it will show you wheel bases on forty five hundred and fifty five hundred trucks. Absolutely. Right. So if you so, that difficulty right there, there's that wheelbase. Look at so we know it's a regular cab and we know it's a hundred and forty five forty hundred and forty five inch wheelbase. Mm -hmm. I mean. I don't know if anybody's so, ever done that. That's hard to find. And look at the production date. There's a true OE production date. Um, so anybody that may be interested, right? I'm, I'm going to pop up JC's email here on the bottom. So you can reach out to Jonathan here. Um, questions, pricing, how it works, all those types of things. Um, I know they can set up some programs, right? So you can allow people to do a little test run, yep. right? And, and that kind of thing. Um, just, you know, mention, Hey, I saw you on, you know, profit teams, Facebook page or whatever. Um, I will be taking this session and putting it onto the profit team, YouTube page. Um, also, so that it has accessibility over there. So if someone says to you, or, Hey, did you see that thing with rainwater and Cahill? Well, I'm not on Facebook. Everything is on our profit team, YouTube page. So I kind of, I take all this stuff from here and bring it over to YouTube. That way, a lot of, it's not everyone's on Facebook to allow everybody to use that, but um, you know, and I don't, we're going on 40 minutes, but listen, anybody that has any questions or comments or anything, please reach out to JC. Or if you know, Todd, you know, Todd can help you with any of your questions, or if you can't get a hold of them, get a hold of me and I'll get you a hold of them. But, um, you know, I've seen the product work. Um, it does work. It is a great tool. I think that it can help both salespeople and buying, um, and, you know, the other thing is it's convenience, everyone, right? It's about having multiple tools on one page for salespeople to get as much done quickly in one spot. Correct. I know there's a lot of tools out there and we can go to a lot of different places. Most salespeople don't do that because it takes time, right? So, uh, but it's been a pleasure, JC, to have you on here. 
Um, I hope we do this again. Him and JC and I were talking a little bit about, you know, this was a little business today. Um, but we talked about hopping on and just telling some old war stories and some funny <laughs> junkyard jamboree stuff um, in the past. Right. Um, and, and telling those stories and making it a little entertaining, uh, do a little business as well. For anybody that's out there, my new sales group sessions are starting on April 4th. If anybody is looking to get their salespeople trained, uh, it's a little three-month class that I have once a week for 50 minutes. Get a hold of me. Um, we're setting up the classes to start on April 4th. Um, and I will see all my Ontario auto recyclers here in uh, next next weekend, I believe. I'm going 31st, April 1st <coughs> in Ontario, and then the week after, I think JC and I will both be in New Orleans. Yeah, you'll see us. Uh, and actually, JC and I are going to be doing a back-to-back two-hour sales class um, in New Orleans together, which will yep. be, I think, the second time we've ever really done a, a class together. We were lucky enough to do something in Orlando um, in January together. And uh, so we're looking forward to see everyone in New Orleans. Uh, but reach out to JC or Todd Vinmatch Pro. Get a hold of me, everyone, and uh, it's been a pleasure, JC. Hey, I really appreciate it, Rob, and I, I, I want to tell you I really appreciate the work and and I appreciate uh, what you're doing for the industry. And I've I've just been seeing I just been seeing so much nice growth from the people that you've been involved with. So anybody watching this and 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 thinks you know I you know I spend time I consider myself a sales you know expert, but Rob is really taking it to the next level. So if you're if you're a salesperson, sales manager, plant manager, and you're struggling to figure out to get that right person to move the needle. Rob, I've, I've had Rob, not only, not only did Rob work with my teams, he worked with teams that I'm involved with and he's just, he just does an outstanding job. So don't, don't get caught up in what you think. Let it, just let it happen. Appreciate the plug everyone. Have a great week. Thanks.